Okay, hi, welcome to the call. Uh, slightly uh, delayed due to Zoom shenanigans. Um, thank you again. Uh, if we could just go around and introduce ourselves along with our organizational affiliation, that would be great. Uh, I'll start, I'm Timothy Hill, um, chair of the W3C group and um, working for the Open Data Institute. Tom, can you introduce yourself? Hi guys, uh, Tom here, co-founder of Played. And uh, Chris? Hi folks, it's Chris Poynton, I'm co-founder of Raceplay. And uh, Nick? Hello, uh, Nick Evans, um, working on the Open Active Project as part of the ODI team and also uh, at IMIN. And Paige. Hi everyone, I'm Paige Moretta here. I am the business development manager over at Playfinder. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all. Um, so this call is going to be concerning an issue which I think has been in Open Active's focus for a long time. Um, it's got a bit of a, I think a piecemeal history with the project. So this is accessibility, uh, i.e communicating using our data standards uh, what kind of services and facilities are available to people with um, enhanced accessibility needs. Um, so I will start sharing my screen with you and start off with a little bit of a history uh, and then talk about the most recent proposal on the table, which um, I mostly wrote. Um, I think there are two parts to this conversation, uh, as Nick pointed out in one of the comments on the GitHub issues. Um, on the one hand, there is the difficulty of assessing what kind of needs we actually need to satisfy using the specification and who speaks for the communities and groups that would benefit from enhanced accessibility description within the standards. The other half of the equation is system providers and activity providers and uh, how feasible it is for them to supply this kind of information and what kind of costs it incurs. Obviously, this group of people today is going to be mostly the latter group. Um, so this conversation, I think, will be largely about validating or questioning some of the assumptions in the proposals uh, from a business point of view in terms of who we consult for making sure that the proposal actually meets uh, accessibility needs. I think that will mostly be handled by consultation with interested parties like UK Active and um, um, uh, the organization that handles accessibility um, activity finders, the name of which is currently escaping me. Anyway, there will be sector representatives and experts in the field who can talk about accessibility needs. Is that the Activity Alliance? Uh, the, so the Activity Alliance comes into it. Um, I was actually thinking of Parasport. Right. Um, so yeah, it'll be Parasport, the Activity Alliance, UK Active. Uh, those groups we can consult with uh, regarding accessibility needs. Um, most of what I'm about to say is based on research from Sport England and the Activity Alliance. Um, so let me just get sharing here. Um, Okay, so as I said, the agenda is really revisiting accessibility. Um, starting with a historical review, um, and Nick can, will probably have uh, points to add here because he's been involved right from the start. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we've had a kind of piecemeal approach through most of the history of Open Active, and this very much reflects where the sector has been in terms of how it addresses these needs. Um, Accessibility has been, I think, difficult to deal with in a comprehensive way, and there have been various data models and descriptors used for describing um, accessibility provision. Mm. So we've had a proposal in the past about uh, a Boolean value, value, true or false, about whether uh, a venue is wheelchair accessible. We've had a couple of controlled vocabularies proposed. Um, one of them is for special requirements. Uh, this was, I think, a 
basically a list that EMD was using or had evolved over the years, sort of ad hoc to describe the suitability of some of their courses, so whether they were good for um, post-operative conditions, whether they were good for cancer support, that kind of thing. Um, very much a, a sort of heterogeneous list of, of terms. There's also been accessibility support, which is a more principled approach, um, which Nick authored. Um, and this was kind of a top level classification of you know, sensory impairments, mobility impairments, learning disabilities, that kind of thing, describing the, um, broadly speaking, the families of accessibility needs that were addressed by particular events. Um, um, yeah, it's worth saying on that one that that was authored based on a bottom-up approach. So actually, um, uh, I, I, although I authored the, um, the JSON file, Lee was actually the one that put the list together. So um, it, we we did it, and it, it, there's probably a, in the archive somewhere there's a video on this. Um, but we um, Lee did a, a comprehensive um, uh, analysis of the feeds available at the time with a, with a spreadsheet, that, and then from all the feeds that had accessibility information in. Um, we drilled down and, and that was where that that small list came from that's that's that that vocabulary so then published that as a json file and then uh, when emd came to um adopt the the standard they noticed that there was one missing which was around um uh social something um oh social behavioral yeah that's right that's right exactly so emd proposed that and we added that um and so that's it so it's it's bottom up with the exception of that uh, entry, which is uh, from EMD. And by bottom up, I mean that was that was at the time all the ac all the activity finders that were around were, were doing something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but this was about three or four years ago. Okay, so so both of those are based on sort of what the sector is doing at the is doing now or was doing at the time, sort of about the data that was available then. Um, I think. Um, the issue sort of lay dormant for a couple of years. Um, I revived it back in about November, I think looking at it from the opposite perspective. So less where we are now and what we're doing now and more where we would like to be. Um, that was mostly motivated by the fact that Sport England had re released a few reports uh, that were fairly substantial about accessibility provision and what was needed in the sector and what was missing in the sector in particular. Um, so I read those and came up with a, an initial proposal, basically. Um, it was a little bit hard to validate, though, um, simply because I wasn't, I wasn't too sure whether reading a few Sport England reports, even though they were quite comprehensive, was enough. Um, so I then just recently, after talking with UK Active a little bit and feeling more confident that we could assemble people to review uh, the issue from the accessibility side. I then made, I just did a sort of take two of that, uh, read a few more documents from the Activity Alliance, looked a little bit at national and international standards for, for describing disability. Um, and that has led to um, a second accessibility proposal, along with a proposal for essentially bulking up the controlled vocabularies that we already have and systematizing them a bit. Uh, so I was going to jump into just walking through the revised accessibility proposal right now, but before I do that, um, does anybody have any questions about the approach so far? Nothing here. Okay. Um, so the proposal as it stands right now... Um, there's a couple of changes to sort of top level data points. Um, the first one is to use transport note, which is right now defined only on the root specification, um, and make that part of the opportunity specification itself. Um, transport note is a fairly simple data object, but it basically tells people how to get to the venue. The reason it's accessibility relevant is simply because public, well, two reasons. 
The first is that typically accessibility provision is quite centralized. So equipment like pool hoists and that kind of thing tends to really only be available at the larger leisure centers. Um, and people with enhanced accessibility needs often are reliant on public transport. Uh, so one of the points that came out of the Sport England reports was that information about transportation options is much, much more important to people with, with disabilities, and in particular severe disabilities, uh, than it is to the populace at large. Um, so including that information with the opportunities would be quite helpful. Um, the next proposal was actually to drop the existing accessibility fields. Um, I think because they're not terribly well differentiated from each other. Um, between special requirements and accessibility information, um, they're not really orthogonal. Um, so it wasn't clear to my mind what went into one and what went into the other um, and, and quite how they differed. Um, special requirements, sorry, is EMD's proposal, is that right? That's right, yeah, and they've got the controlled vocabulary for that. Um, but it wasn't clear to me exactly how that related to accessibility information. Um, it just seemed a little bit fuzzy how those two were divided from each other. Isn't accessibility information the free text field? Um, potentially, yeah. Um, well, what, why, why are they orthogonal? Sorry, sir, I'm just trying to understand. So you've got, um, you've got accessibility information, which is the, um, generally, so in the example of British Cycling, it's like, this is a number you call to understand more about the requirements, and we'll talk you through it, um, that type of text. Um, and and that special requirements is obviously, as you say, that EMD's more specific list of, um, of what they consider to be accessibility um, categories of some sort. But accessibility support, is another list, which is a higher level list. So I, I, yeah, I guess. Well, yeah, so this, yeah, it's just how do, how do those relate to each other? So you've got one list that was just sort of EMD's evolved list of things that they've got basically. Accessibility support was a kind of, I guess, generalization of special requirements. And then accessibility information was there to give further information about either of those. Uh, access to information is just context for just free text context um, because most of the research that um, at the time showed that the accessibility requirements are generally it's a complex thing it's really mm -hmm. difficult to codify so the best thing to do is to include information about how someone with accessibility needs can contact um, the activity provider and 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 that would be what that accessibility information generally had in it Right, okay. Well, I think the guidance is perhaps not terribly specific there, maybe by design. Um, like it's a, it's a bag then, I guess. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah, so, so you've got two overlapping special requirements and accessibility support, and then you've got a third bag which could clarify one or potentially both of those, I guess. Um, You can, you, can, you can see how there's a kind of conceptual blurriness there, I guess, which is maybe helpful in the sense that because accessibility needs are widely defined, there's a wide variety of things you might want to say about them, but it creates problems for parsing. Like, what are, what are you expecting to find in accessibility information, I guess? Yeah, right. That, that stuff just gets displayed to the user. That doesn't, there's, no, there's no kind of filtering happening there. I suppose the, the idea broadly was that uh, accessibility support and special requirements were used for filtering and accessibility information was used to display to the user information that they can then use to act. Um, but then there wasn't anything more possible than that. At, at right, that time. right, okay. So I guess my question would be, if we, if we are dropping accessibility information, it would seem that we would need to replace it with some free text field somewhere, unless yeah. that requirement for free text information, which, because a lot of, um, Publishers just just don't just have an accessibility statement, right? They don't have even um, the detail to fill out more than that. So I, I guess that's why I'm interested in, in if if we're dropping a field which is currently populated mm -hmm. in the data right now um, by publishers that don't necessarily have more information than they are publishing, then that would seem to be losing information. So right. I, I guess so. So but dropping something where there's information being lost. That would be a question of, well, where does that then go and what are, what's our advice to those publishers? 
but I, sorry, I don't mean to, to get into the weeds on that, that one, but that Well, I think, I think that'll be clarified with the subsequent discussion there. Um, so, so really what the proposal is now that I just wrote on the weekend, essentially, was um, um, to expand accessibility support into a complex data object. Um, and a multi-valued complex, uh, well, multiple complex data objects are possible. Um, and that this is a much more descriptive kind of object with more detail and therefore being more parsable within that. Um, so there's name, which would be free text and, and brief, hopefully. Um, participant condition supported. So this would be taking the place of the old CVs, basically. So this would be the bit that was about um, what kind of disabilities or accessibility needs were generally being net met. Um, description, which would be a free text field, um, and I guess would be the home for what used to be in accessibility information. Um, hours available. So with a lot of leisure centers that offer accessibility support, that is actually depending upon a small number of staff who are trained in using the equipment or giving advice or leading classes or whatever. Um, and they do not work all of the time. Um, so it's often important to couple availability with information about accessibility. So if you do offer use of a pool hoist or something like that, you have to make indicate when that's actually there. Um, is advance notice required is a refinement of the same issue in that um, often it's not even a question of hours being available, it's about advance notice being needed. So you actually have to book in to use some particular dedicated piece of equipment. Um, carer policy is there to capture information about whether carers can attend, what the pricing policy is with regard to them and so on and so forth. Um, Contact point emerges from an issue that Nick just highlighted actually, where one of the points raised repeatedly and expressed in both the Sport England and the Activity Alliance reports is that often people just want further information and typically that means they want to have email or telephone contact with somebody. Um, so this is a dedicated space for that basically, saying who you should talk to uh, about those kinds of concerns. Uh, and with, in particular, there's, uh, in the schema.org model for that, there is a field for indicating whether something is available in Braille and other alternative formats. Uh, so this would be a nice slot for that kind of alternative representation. Um, URL should be self-explanatory. Um, I think this raises a question about where accessibility information sits because sometimes in real life, it's a property of the event. So it will be a particular class that is aimed at people who are recovering from a stroke or people recovering from cardiac difficulties or visually um, impaired people, so on and so forth. Um, other times it will really be a property of the facility for things like wheelchair accessibility and so on. Um, so scanning around various leisure center websites, I did find there was often a lot of accessibility information on particular web pages. Um, but of course, if what you have is an RPDE feed of events, then that information is largely lost. So I guess a, there's a question about how we link those pieces of information together, assuming that we don't necessarily want to be copying information into every single event. Um, and then uh, there's a review uh, possible. Um, this seems to be something that's done in some leisure centers more on the private end, things like Virgin Active and that kind of stuff, um, where there are communities of people with accessibility needs who are given a space to review the features that they had there. Um, and this seems to be a valued kind of feature. Um, so in an ideal world, I think those kinds of review um, functionalities would be available to people with accessibility needs. Um, so that's the big complex data model. Um, another top level property, accessibility support level. Um, this reflects a division used in Activity Alliance reports about whether 
accessibility support is seen as something that is, well, simply non-existent, whether it's something that exists as part of regular classes or whether there's actually dedicated classes or a separate track uh, for people with accessibility needs. And that's quite important top level information. So that's represented there. Um, and then just the final bit of the proposal is just to note that the other data attribute where accessibility and facility information could live would be an amenity feature. And that's often where it does live right now. Things like wheelchair ramp or uh, wheelchair lift or something will be listed as an amenity feature. And I think ideally we would want to have all of the accessibility information living together um, if possible. We don't want it to be scattered between these two things so that you have to parse uh, both if you want good accessibility information. Uh, so that is the um, proposal as a whole. Uh, Nick made a comment on there just that this is this is ambitious basically um, and there's a cost involved to data publishers about getting this kind of information and integrating it into the system. Um, I think that's right. I mean I think what it what inspired this is that Open Active's mission is to get inactive people more active. That's really the core of it. Um, and people with accessibility needs are a really core audience there. Um, the Activity Alliance's 2019 survey, which was just published, indicated that uh, it was a large proportion, something like 40% of people with disabilities uh, are classified as inactive. So they're not getting 30 minutes of physical activity a week. Um, and 80% said that they wanted to do more. Um, so it seems like this is a crucial need to address, but it is about the practicality of addressing it within the data format and getting this kind of information. Uh, so I guess that's a question I would open up to everyone is, what are the obstacles that people foresee here, or does this seem pretty doable? Seems doable from my perspective. Oh. Uh, Likewise. Okay, so this is this is information you feel that most organizations will have or could could easily collect. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, they should have that info. Okay, all right. Um, so then it's a question about just making sure it's in the right kind of um, data slot, I suppose. Um, so Nick, did you have anything to uh, to add to that? Hello. Um, so I had, yeah. So I guess my question with this is um, is really, as I said in there, really, um, it, it seems like something that needs a slightly more holistic approach than just publishing. I mean, we might be it might be that we can just get away with publishing. Um, you know, with, with some um, kind of more tail provider systems um, plugging in and and then just, you know, putting, putting these fields in and seeing if we can populate them. But I kind of feel like before we go ahead and, and so as much as this, this is this is like a really great start, because this is starting from the standards and working backwards almost, mm -hmm. I feel like we, we need to make sure, as I guess I said in the comment, that we, we don't just kind of crack on and, and implement necessarily without checking with users that this is going to work both on both sides. Um, and so I wonder if, if it's a case of, you know, having maybe in partnership with some of the early implementing systems, having discussions with users to see if they'd be able to fill out the information, you know, if they thought that this is kind of useful. Um, specifically the people in the centers who, who deal with accessibility support themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So those specialists um, and seeing if this is something that that they think will work, and then on the other side, where you've got the um, where you've got the apps that are going to display the information. At the moment, there's quite a lot of fields that aren't being displayed on activity finders, um, just because they're not populated in enough cases that people are building them into their user interfaces. So more fields isn't necessarily better generally, it seems, because people don't generally use them. Um, and so I guess that's that's the thing. If we're moving from like a, a blanket, some text in here, 
to um, yeah, putting putting all this information to lots of different places in lots of different fields. Um, then yeah, implementation experience so far shows that we'll likely get less uptake um, of that across a number of activity funds, unless this is part of a wider initiative that brings in the activity finders, that brings in some of the publishers, that brings in, you know, all these different stakeholders and says, we're going to try this and we're going to make sure it works end to end. And we're going to get some users involved. And I guess that's, that's kind of what I was saying in the comment. Probably rather than starting from the spec, although the spec is a great place um, in terms of implementation to start from, we should, we should kind of go back and, and get that wider group together uh, and figure out the implementation plan before we settle on what the spec looks like, possibly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the point is more to validate this or question it. So I guess that's why I mentioned other, the accessibility end of it being what we want validation of in the first instance. Um, I think because the voices have been fairly consistent for go, you know, going on like a decade now, or at least from 2012, um, that accessibility needs aren't being met. Um, and I can certainly see national campaigns addressing this kind of thing, but we do need this point to start from. Um, and I think if we try to, if we try to do, well, okay, I think all the survey work has basically been done already in the research that is linked above. Um, because things like the Activity Alliance, that is coming out of clubs that do cater specifically for people with disability needs and so on and so forth. So a certain amount of that experience is already in those reports. Um, so I think it's probably, I think, well, you're right that it does need further validation. I don't think we need to necessarily go back to square one and say, we don't know anything about this. What should it look like? I think, I think you know, it's a reasonably well-informed proposal. Um, so Sorry, to clarify, yes, I wasn't saying back to square one. You're, you're, yeah, totally. I was saying um, we, we should take what we've got here and test it with okay, people yeah. before, we, before we move to um, push mass adoption or integrate it into the standard. Uh, the first thing is probably to test it with, a, like, so, you know, with no technology, just putting it in, in real terms in front of people with mocked up interfaces or whatever. Yeah. Um, so when you say real people, who do you mean by that? Um, well, I guess like I was saying, the users on both sides. So people that would put the information in on the one side, who have who have sessions that would be applicable here, um, and people who would search on the other side to see if the information being displayed is useful. Mm -hmm. um, because because I suppose the reason I'm saying that is the cost of implementing this is so enormous, um, because all the different systems will have to adopt this. And pushing that through all the systems, as we know, can be can be challenging. Um, Nick, Nick, Tim, I don't know whether I can help here, but um, one of our sort of headline clients is with British Wheelchair Basketball. They use Playways as their whole game system. So from they, they use Playways from a search and a data publishing perspective. So they create and they have people searching. So we've got a full sort of full case. Most wheelchair basketballs also delivered in leisure centres. So we we can kind of use them as a, as a very good example that are engaged in this and, and have chosen Playways for open active reasons to, to go and test this with the market. Okay, great. That, that's fantastic. In fact, I, I spoke to them a little bit when I, was, when I was ramping up to the proposal. So if we could actually continue that relationship, that would be fantastic. Yeah, they, they might be more familiar with engaging with us and, my, and their client manager from my side to, um, to, to, to help move it forward from a relationship perspective. And understand what they're, they'll find is quite overwhelming, but we can break that down for them. Okay, that was, okay. Um, yeah, that's, that sounds exactly the kind of thing. I guess, I mean, if you think about the way you would design a system, um, is you would, you would wireframe it first, and you might even test those wireframes with people, or at least have a good idea about how you would, um, yeah, go, what, what your users were, what the MVP would look like. You maybe would create something very basic and quick and get it trialed. The problem with a with an ecosystem like this is that the MVP is like a is if we yeah if the MVP is ecosystem wide standards implementation that's a very big long heavy process but if we can do an MVP which is yeah as Charlie's saying if there's a one or two organisations that maybe have an end to end here that we could try stuff with and iterate it quickly um, so that if someone says oh this doesn't work because 
there's whatever we can we can change that without needing to have uh, just thinking about the way that we did virtual for example we we pushed that virtual stuff through very quickly but to make changes to it at this stage now when there's several systems who've implemented it would be costly because everyone's gonna have to go back and redo that. Um, whereas if we're doing it with maybe one or two systems to start with and front ends involved and um, publishers involved, that, that that's probably the way to do it. Okay. Um, I'm surprised you see it as so costly, to be honest. Um, I mean, it is, I, I thought the cost would be mostly in the information gathering stage. Um, you know, somebody needs to formulate a carer policy or at least find where it is if it's written down somewhere and that kind of stuff. Um, but you're seeing this more as a systems cost. Well, it's both, right? So when you add a new field to a system, you have to go around and get everyone to fill in the field. Um, and you have to build it into a user interface, expose it in your feed. And on the other side, people who are consuming that information have to pro expose it in the search, add any relevant filters if that's, that's required. Um, so there's quite a lot of steps. Um, and then see if people use it at the end. I, I, I also suspect, Nick, I, I kind of agree with your, your thoughts about just going to market with the concepts first in that I think this is going to sort of potentially that the requirements are going to differ quite greatly between sort of low level, um, maybe like tail activity providers for using a coining a phrase, um, people like clubs on the ground who are very small. I mean, the, the, the disability clubs are naturally smaller than, than um, able-bodied or non-disability clubs. And their, their sort of time, their time and understanding of these things will be far lower. Their needs around it might be not as specific as an organization like a governing body delivering um, formal programs and participation programs in leisure centers for that sport where their, their need to provide that sort of information will be far greater. So I just think the user behavior at different levels will also be different. So I, I probably want to run this past the experts before we started building against it for sure. Yeah, I mean, so some real examples here. Yeah, absolutely agree. So if you were thinking about this in the context of something like the Gladstone system, um, you would be looking at, you know, that this the example here is within a slot, but the slots are massive. Like there's there's a huge volume of slots. So to add this to a slot um, would be would be something that would be very time intensive for an organisation to do. They might want to add it at a further a level further up. Um, mm -hmm. But the way this is designed uh, is for good reason at, at the moment is that you know this is all specific information about that slot. So there's one. What's the inclusion support for that one slot? But that, like I said, if if you've got you know, hundreds of thousands of activities running across your estate, putting that information in and maintaining it is, is a burden that they might not want to take on. So I guess what does that look like if you're looking at not just two slots, but a hundred slots? Um, and, and that's like, you completely agree, Charlie, that's the kind of conversation you get into where you have on the one hand, a stakeholder like GLL having the conversation with, uh, on the other hand, you've got a single activity provider who's maybe got two or three sessions a week. Um, you may be putting them in as sessions, not slots, um, and, and maybe considering um, the information differently. Is again, is it a slot level for them? Is it an organizational level thing? And do they have the information to make it slot level? Uh, those kind of considerations. Which I guess raises the question of, I'm actually not too sure where this data should live, or at least it's clear to me that it should live at the event level in many cases. So there will be sessions that are put on specifically for people with accessibility needs. Um, a lot of the time it's kind of facility level and I'm not too sure how that should be represented. Um, and it could be just with pointers, right? It could be, here's a URL, you know, look at our main website or something. Um, but I think this is a problem that we've run into before with accessibility. I'm just wondering what you and, and Lee's discussions have led you to before. So the accessibility information at the moment is event level um, and that session series can be scheduled session so you can leverage the hierarchy to put that information at any point that makes sense. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, we could put the information in the same place. I guess, I guess it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably it's probably quite a similar idea actually in terms of this th these fields that you've kind of this example here could go um, at any level. So something like is wheelchair accessible? So that because I think of that as really being a you know it's a it's a facility or building issue most of the time. Um, so that was living with within 
event throughout. It wasn't part of location or... Yeah, it was an event. We had a big debate about whether it should be in location. Um, but the decision in the end was that um, there's lots of things that make something wheelchair accessible. Um, and, and the facility alone isn't necessary enough. Right. And so without, without, modeling, over, without over modeling it, mm -hmm. it was easy just to say, is this event wheelchair accessible? Okay, right. So this ends up Okay, so this is this is really. I mean, I'd also sort of add to that, and this is where I'm not talking as an expert at all. But my learning from wheelchair basketball over the last couple of years is um, we can't just we can't simply assume that we're talking purely about the wheelchair in that they have able-bodied participants who play the sport. They their activities will cater for certain disabilities at different times, um, so they'll be putting on programs that target certain certain types of disability. Um, in which case, it'd be very event it could be quite event specific. Um, and whether something is only suitable for disabled athletes or for both, because they have a whole classification matrix in in, in these sports. Um, again, I'm not an expert, but yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to get their input into exactly where this data should live because they will have a better idea of what type of sessions tend to get delivered, where and what, what the location impact is and, and to who and what the to who impact is, who we're targeting. Right. So yeah, it gets, it gets quite fine grained, I guess. And that's the kind of, we need that kind of fine grained feedback too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, this could be as simple as, right? Just just getting a spreadsheet with these columns in or something or a Google form or whatever uh, as an MVP and asking them to fill it out for some sessions that they have and seeing if, if it fits and if they've got questions and if, you know, if this is, um, yeah, if this does everything. So the research says it should, right? Because that's the stuff that people are missing. Um, but, but when it's put in front of real people, does it, does it work in, does the theory work in practice? Yeah, it's a good way. It's a good way to validate that. Yeah, I, I like the spreadsheet idea more just because I feel like once you get into wireframing, you get a lot of other issues getting raised. Um, so, but anyway, yeah, we can, we should definitely take it up with wheelchair basketball just as a sort of initial sanity check and pilot. Um, okay, does anybody else have anything to add on that head? If we're agreed that that some kind of validation would be would be ideal, or not just ideal, necessary. Yeah, I, I think working out how how to fit this at various levels is part of the trick, and also maybe to refer to so to be able to uh, simply say this slot is one of our slots of this type, so that you're not necessarily screening you know, 2,000 2, bytes per slot of identical information that we can push this stuff out. Uh, and I'm pretty sure we've you know, got the ability to refer out to other URLs and then the clients can cache that and encrypt it once. Um, certainly, uh, the, the things in my mind in the, in the sort of running and cycling world are uh, Parkrun has, uh, some Parkruns have uh, guide, run guides for partially sighted runners. Um, that would be something that was usually at the uh, event series level, I guess. It would be right. Mm -hmm. uh, the high park park run has 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 people available. X Y Z other park run doesn't have people available. So the, again, this kind of gets more wobbly with that because uh, the the uh, running guides provision is actually sort of separate and in parallel with park run. So you as a partially sighted runner. Can access that for a run that you're just doing on your own. It, it, it's not so. so I, I guess you know we, we're limiting this to the um, the session uh, it, itself. You know that's, that's what we're talking about here. Is, is uh, not. I don't know how we would model that facility outside the context of there being some session that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one was uh, just, again, just trying to go for taking mixed prompt for sort of real world examples. There's a um, co-biking scheme in a local country park here um, where um, people with uh, both learning and physical uh, needs can ride a, a sort of a double um, tricycle type thing with somebody else and they'll, they're, they're, you know, they get to go for a bike ride with 
another person sort of assisting where in whatever way is necessary. Um, and I think with that, you know, the overall offering, that is the thing they do. Um, I'll just uh, quickly uh, share that one as a, as a for example. I'll just send it in the chat. Here. So that's, um, that's the shared biking thing. Um, and I guess uh, British Grind Sport, who manages the, um, who, who organises the accreditation and DBS checks and things for, for, for guide runners. Um, so again, good organisations to maybe reach out to as part of a, sure. it does this fit the bill for you guys. And maybe talk to some park run guys where you've got, you know, British Blind Sport is not going to necessarily be talking about publishing. Uh, but they may be supportive in how you define things and then um, uh, Parkrun could tell you a bit more about publishing. Does Parkrun publish an open active feed? I haven't checked that actually. Um, we're supposed to be helping them do that, in fact, is the answer right. to that last question. Um, okay, but uh, uh, yeah, it will be, be included when it happens. Then. So yeah, again, I guess it's a group that we've got a, an existing relationship with, so maybe just yeah. throwing this into the conversation is, is a good next step. Um, okay, I'm, I'm just going to, oh, sorry, uh, any further points? Uh, that's it for me. Okay, I'm just going to then um, point to another part of the proposal. This is, I think, probably um, a whole separate, if not just call, a whole separate body of people, potentially, but so one thing that I attempted to do, looking at the controlled vocabularies we already had defined, um, it seemed to me that they were both aimed at categorizing the kinds of disability people uh, experienced, um, but that they were a little bit hard to mesh. And then going through the Activity Alliance and the Sport England research, there were other hierarchies in there as well. Um, I also looked at a couple of controlled vocabularies that were much more formal, like SNOMED for medical conditions and that kind of thing, which were just much, much, much too formal. So it did seem to me that what we do need to have some kind of standard representation of the kinds of accessibility needs that the sector caters for or could cater for, um, but that we didn't really have a good uh, list for that right now. Um, all of the ones that we had were just slightly, slightly overlapping, did slightly different things. Uh, it wasn't entirely clear how they related to each other and so on and so forth. So I made a tentative stab at what I ended up calling the participant condition supported controlled vocabulary, um, which is a list that looks like this on uh, issue 241. Um, I'm not, I'm certainly, it would be interested to hear feedback on the contents of the list. And Nick has already made a couple of good points about things like terminology and um, uh, the relationship of items in the hierarchy to each other. So I think it would be useful to have feedback on the actual contents of the list right now. Um, I think there's also a separate conversation to be had about how this kind of list gets managed. Because I think one of the difficult things about the accessibility space is that it's actually not entirely clear who sits in that space. Um, that's a problem at the level of end users. Um, so a lot of people with sensory impairments do not necessarily consider themselves to be disabled. Um, there are groups that come to define themselves as disabled uh, or as requiring activity provision um, and support uh, like so the emergence of social and behavioral concerns in recent years. So it is kind of a fluctuating space. So my feeling is that if we did want to have a controlled vocabulary like this, we probably actually need to make this a continuous curation process. Um, kind of along the lines of the activity list, where we've got a committee of people who oversee the activity list who meet on a regular basis and say, okay, this goes in the list at this point, this doesn't go in the list or it should be moved to a separate part of the list or whatever. Um, so this is a kind of initial seed for that, uh, but there's probably a broader kind of support organization that needs to, to go into that. Um, so given that we've only got four minutes left, um, is there anyone on the call who's got something to add to that general proposal there?
Um, to what extent does that vocabulary map to SOMED? Is there any relationship between them or? Not really, no. 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 Um, I mean, obviously there's some terms in common like cerebral palsy, um, you know, but um, it doesn't really have any, any relationship. Um, I've worked with SNOMED in the past in like specifically medical domains. Um, and I just took another look at it again and it was like, yeah, obviously just doing something much, much different. There's also the fact that SNOMED has its own problems. So part of me thought, am I making, or am I making anyone's life easier if we, if we bring SNOMED into it? And my general conclusion was no. I, I think the context is, is quite different to a clinical context and it, it's, uh, and it's not that I know SNOMED very closely, but my wife's a medical researcher and has done a lot of disease classification stuff over the years. So I've kind of absorbed some by osmosis. Um, uh, yeah, I guess it, it looks great and I've no idea whether it's right. And so <laughs> it's a question of who we can ask it's right and whether their, their, their response is actually meaningful or as you say, whether to, to leave it open and, and see, how, see how the contributions come to it. it it's, it's a little hard to know. Uh, yeah, the, the, there's obviously it. weird gaps. Like I was basing it on values we already had. So under cancer support, right now there's only breast cancer support, and presumably that's you know as many as there there are kinds of cancer, there are kinds of cancer support. But um, so there's, there's obvious gaps there right now. Um, there's, there's also I, I, yeah, as, as I, yeah, as Chris was saying, I, I think there's there's a thing about who do we ask. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I'm aware of is that. Uh, that we might even be offending people w without knowing, right? Because we just don't know the domain. Yeah. Um, for example, pregnancy support is currently under what? What was the heading above it in the list? Uh, physical There's, environment. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, so uh, yeah, antenatal or postnatal being a physical impairment may not be the best. But I don't. Obviously, that's a, that's an obvious example. But what are the other things in there that m maybe we're implying? Obesity being a physical impairment. I know. I don't. You know. Is I feel like there's a there's a potential minefield here that we we're just not able to fully see. Oh yeah, I mean, for instance, under um, uh, actually um, under hear, labeling hearing impairment, um, a, a lot of the hard of hearing and deaf societies uh, really reject the impairment label. So yeah, it is very much a political kind of question, and so the. The issue of who you ask and what kind of labels you use, um, yeah, it does is is an involved one, absolutely. Um, I think in terms of who we ask, it's probably it's tricky because I think it's both the people who represent people with accessibility needs, and it's also again, as in the last issue, it's going to be about the physical activity sector, because I think it's important that the aim is not have a perfect taxonomy of all of the possible conditions it's have a taxonomy that's useful in supporting people that have a variety of conditions. Um, and so it's not necessarily going to be formally very tidy. Um, so it's going to be a slightly messy group of people who would be responsible for, for curating that. Um, but I think, <clears throat> I think- It's a great, it's a great start. Sorry, don't, I don't I have to restate my point for a minute. It's, it's, this is all brilliant, really good progress. I don't think this is this is this is definitely a steps in the right direction because bringing these vocabularies together, we didn't have anyone um, who was I don't think brave enough to do it before <laughs> because of all the reasons outlined. Um, so good, well, good is, that we've got that. This is sort of it. That looking through the literature, there's a definitely like a strong sense of something needs to be done, and that's kind of where it gets left. Um, so yeah, I think it is. I don't, yeah, I think risky is the wrong word. I think we have to be sensitive to the needs of people in the community. Um, but, you know, the ultimate insensitivity would be doing nothing and being like, well, <laughs> you know, not No, no, no I, I, absolutely. It's almost like if, if we can figure a way of bringing everyone with us on yeah. the journey. And by, I, it sounds like it's people in this school are, are really helpful in terms of and figuring out which stakeholders to involve. But it's almost like if we can make sure that if we get to the end of this and, and all the bodies that were involved in those reports, how we'll all look at it and go, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. That was, I'm glad you spearheaded this and we've come with you on the journey and we're behind the result and we can see it's been validated and we're happy to back it. Um, then 
I think that's a really strong place to go to all the systems and say, right, now we're going to need to prioritize this in your backlog because this is going to create, um, you know, significant um, um, benefit for a lot of users. Um, and, and like I said, like learning lessons from the, from the, the stuff we did around um, virtual only recently, we, we defined a whole bunch of properties there. Only a very, very small number of those actually have uptake. Um, I think one maybe uh, across the board, two or three maybe have have ninety percent coverage, and then the rest is you know one one or two providers implemented. So I, I think you know if we're going to have everyone adopt all of these fields, um, I think we really need to have a compelling like this is well researched, this is something that we know will work, and we've got people that have said it's you know therefore put it on your backlog above other things that you've got on your list because we know that it's going to be worth worth doing. Yeah, and I think it's also, I mean, I guess the other point I'd make is, is, is kind of agreeing with that is that it is prescriptive. Um, that I think in the case of virtual events, you know, where that's only been defined for a month or six weeks. Um, so presumably we'll see uptake further in future of, of a wider variety of data points. If that doesn't happen, it's not a problem, presumably. Um, I think in this case, it's slightly different in that ideally you would get all of those filled in the longer time frame. that maybe not every organization has this information right now, but hopefully in four or five years they will, and then provision is better for people with accessibility needs. So it's got a slightly different focus that way. Um, sorry, we're, th we're a little over the hour, um, so we should wind this up, but before we do, is there any other business to bring? No. Okay, great. Thank, thank you very much for your patience in the delay getting started and uh, the, the corresponding delay ending it. And um, I'll pin you all once the uh, notes are written up.